U.S. biotech and device companies seeking to access European markets are faced with a complicated matrix of decisions, ranging from creating their own marketing infrastructure to outlicensing EU rights for their asset. Today we explore that partnering side of the decision tree with Peter Stein of Norgain, who will provide perspective from a European specialty pharma company seeking to in-license assets. Camille Landis of U.S.-based Relipsa, which recently announced a European partnership for its lead asset, Petiramir, to treat hyperkalemia. And Peter Payne of U.S.-based Chimerix, which is considering European access options for its Phase 3 Brin Sedofavir antiviral. I'm Steve Edelson, a senior editor of BioCentury, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. To delve into European partnering, I'm joined by a very accomplished panel. Camille Landis is VP of Business Development at Relipsa, which is developing and discovering therapeutics based on polymer science. Peter Payne is SVP of Business Development and Corporate Strategy at Chimerix, which is developing and commercializing broad-spectrum antivirals for serious and life-threatening diseases. And Peter Stein is CEO of Norgin, a European specialty pharma company that sells products across the continent. So let's, let's dive in and I'm going to start with Peter. You've spent about at least three decades building infrastructure at your company to sell products in Europe. And in that time, what, what would you say you know, have been the biggest changes um, in Europe that you've seen and how have you adapted your company accordingly? I think well, the first big change is the degree of integration across Europe. So while we all know it's 28 individual national markets and every national market has its own characteristics, uh, more than ever, you have to approach the European market as a single opportunity in an integrated way. Uh, that starts because you have a single registration, which is a single label, and the data which goes into the registration file for that uh, application is going to influence your pricing negotiations across all of the 28 markets. So you have to start with a knowledge of the impact of your decisions on the pricing outcome uh, when you eventually get to that after registration. The second big change is the degree to which pricing has become even more difficult than it was. Europe had always had a constrained pricing environment relative to the United States. Uh, the changes are, are happening exponentially now as each country implements national procedures for controlling the cost of, of pharmaceutical and device products. And you need to incorporate into your clinical trials the endpoints and the data collection so that you can demonstrate the value of your product relative to standard of care. Without that, you will miss an awful lot of value creation for your product. And we, we, we touched on it initially in our previous call, but we'll dive into it more. How do you go about casting your net for products? Uh, we are fundamentally looking for products that change medical care, that will add value and where we believe that we can conduct clinical trials to demonstrate the value that the product brings to the patient and to the payer. We're far less concerned about which therapy area it's in because in today's world, the infrastructure that you need to operate across Europe in a compliant way is so complex, whether it's market access or pharmacovigilance or regulatory affairs. And areas like that are fundamentally therapy area agnostic. When it comes to it, if you have a product that actually is demonstrated to add value, you can create a targeted sales team that is only there to sell an individual product. So we operate with multiple sales teams to sell different products to different therapy areas, while always using the infrastructure that we've created across Europe to support the entire portfolio. So Chimerix has an antiviral that's uh, nearing a phase three data event that's going to happen early next year, I believe. And after that, the company is looking to submit an NDA uh, to the US and MAA in Europe. So can you talk about your current view of the European market and, and what are your factors in shaping that view and how are you thinking about partnering in, in that region? Sure. So I mean, our view on Europe is, is that it's an important market uh, and we've invested time in exploring that market. We've uh, had interactions with EMA uh, on our clinical trial program. Um, we have some sites taking part in that clinical trial program. Um, we've had some interactions with um, health technology assessment agencies as well mm -hmm. and um, you know have done a lot of market research across um, EU particularly EU5 um, uh, in terms of our view on partnering we're very close as you said to a phase 3 data event we've always taken the view that um, we, we know the data is very much going to drive the value proposition of the product the phase 3 trial has been the data set has been set up to 
to, to really show what the value of the product is, both clinically and from a health economics point of view. And we you know, will take a while to look at the data, get very familiar with it, and then we will decide what our approach to partnering is going to be. So uh, this is a, a, probably a partnering situation, or might this be a go it alone? It could be either. Okay. Could be either. Um, you know, that said, we spent a lot of time this year um, getting to know potential partners. Um, you know, I sort of make the uh, analogy to, well, we're not quite sure if we want to get married yet, but if we do get married, we would like to know who we're going to get married to. Good. Now, Relipsa has sort of walked down the aisle, so to speak, and, and partnered in Europe. So Camille, can you maybe walk us through the, the process? Um, you, know, you said there was no shortage of suitors for, for your molecule, Petirimer, but you know, how did you weigh what each suitor was offering? And let's talk about that. Yeah, so we looked at all of our options to commercialize in Europe. And part of that evaluation process was to prioritize what was important to Relipsa. And what made the top in that priority list was maximizing long-term value for our product um, and ensuring that our medicine could get in the hands of patients uh, who need it and who could benefit from it as fast as possible. So ultimately, we decided the best way to do that was through a partner uh, who has experience in Europe. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in the conference call to, to discuss the deal, I, I recall hearing that V4 Fresenius, you know, a key consideration was the size of their sales force. And that's not going to be atypical for a commercialization deal, but uh, uh, are there aspects of your molecule that make it particularly important or especially important? Yes, there is. So our product is a specialty product. The target audience is nephrologists and cardiologists. So there's certainly players in Europe who have experience in cardiology and ones that have experience in nephrology. Mm -hmm. Very few that have experience with both. And V4 Fresenius has that exact commercial footprint that we were looking for. Let's go to the, the timing side of, of how and when to partner in Europe. Um, Granted, there is the caveat that answers are going to vary depending on you know, the asset in question, but I want to sort of pull each panelist and get a sense of how early you know, they think people should be looking for a commercialization partner in Europe. Let's start with, with Peter. Uh, I guess the, the flippant answer is yesterday, um, because I think you can't start early enough. You really have to incorporate European knowledge into the design of your clinical trials, which makes sure that you get the data and the endpoints that you need in order to drive a pricing discussion. Because one of the big differences between Europe and the United States is that the, the goal is not product registration. The goal is reimbursement at an acceptable price, uh, which will allow the adoption of your product. And so because of those differences in goals, uh, we feel strongly that you need to incorporate European knowledge into the design of phase three, which in turn means, of course, your phase two trials. Um, and the way we try to square that with our partners is to structure flexible partnerships um, where we're working together with them and, and maybe the upfront payment is a little bit reduced because it's an earlier stage, but at the end of the day, the upfront payment that uh, you're going to get at the end of a phase three trial is, is coming no earlier than the phase three milestone if you've done a deal much earlier. Mm -hmm. Want to respond, Camille? So we uh, approached it a little bit differently in that we really wanted to have our phase three data in hand when we started a European partnering process. We wanted to have the complete data package, the complete story, the complete value proposition mm -hmm. when we began the process. We were trying to thread a needle. We wanted to get a partner on board before we submitted the MAA filing and we felt getting input in that would be important. And also what goes into the MAA filing has implications for your reimbursement strategy. So we felt getting a partner on board after phase three, but before the filing was critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for us, as I, think, as I mentioned, you know, we've decided to take the approach that we'll, we'll wait until we've seen what our data is. That mm -hmm. said, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with Peter that you need to involve Europe in development, that the goal is reimbursement at an acceptable price. It's not just registration. Uh, and I would, the advice I would give anybody is, yeah, you know, go talk to the European regulators, make sure that any, you could cover for any treatment or treatment differences or, um, you know, practices within your, your protocol, involve European sites and start to build up your KOL base. So is there, and so as Peter said earlier, also go talk to HTAs yeah. um, mm -hmm. because uh, they will very often have a different opinion than the regulator in terms of what the comparator should be and what the endpoints need to be. So we, we have sort of a, a dichotomy of opinions here. We have a couple of US companies who say we want to have our phase three data in hand. Then we have you, know, you Peter, you're saying 
there, or we should have partnered yesterday or should have been thinking about it yesterday. So is there a way to, to square those circles? Is there a happy medium for, for these two approaches? Well, I think the, the happy medium is to find a partner you can work with and make sure that you've uh, identified with that partner what is the development plan for the product for Europe. Um, how big is the pie really before you worry about how to split the pie? Uh, and then construct a partnership that uh, anticipates alternatives and is flexible enough to cater to different outcomes in the phase three trial uh, when they become known. And I might add to that, certainly do your homework before you begin the process. And we also met with the healthcare authority um, assessment uh, people and we met with payers in Europe and we had payer ad boards and so um, we felt very informed when we went into the partnering process and were able to have very productive conversations with potential partners on reimbursement. And that's something you guys are already on the, the payer and absolutely you know, second that that it um, and I can imagine you know, from a, an in licensing perspective nothing worse than just be going kind to of be confronted with a hundred percent US driven data set protocol, clinical trial right. design, no payer research, no primary market research. Um, yeah, do, do you have a, maybe an, an example or an anecdote of a situation like that where, where a partner came to you with you know, sort of a US-centric package and then you kind of had to think about it and, and maybe craft a way to show uh, we, extra we value? We unfortunately have a, a, too many of them. But uh, yeah, we, we've uh, very frequently come across companies that um, come to us with US-based market research to go to Peter's point and just assume that Europe will be about the same thing, about the same size, and you have to go to an ex educational exercise to get to a shared understanding of what the European marketplace really looks like so that um, you can identify how big is the opportunity and what work is it going to re be required to, to capitalize on that opportunity. You know, in the extreme case, we've had situations where uh, companies have uh, licensed to us registered products, which we've then had to go and reformulate and re-register for a new indication simply because the product that they registered was the wrong formulation for the wrong indication for Europe. And by reformulating and re-registering it for a slightly different label, we were able to dramatically increase the market potential of the product. Are those capabilities that, that your company has maybe always had, or is that something that as you've sort of learned how the, the, these US packages are coming to you that you've needed to, to build in? We've very much had to change. Um, as the market has changed and as the uh, degree of data which you need to support a pricing application has increased, uh, we've strengthened our market access teams throughout Europe, uh, which is really fundamental to the evaluation of any opportunity. So whereas I think we started uh, years ago with more of a medical evaluation of licensing on opportunities, now it is very much medical and market access working together. After the decision to partner is, is made, you know, what are some reasonable next steps? And I'll, I'll ask each of you, is it to go about, obviously you want to go about meeting with prospective partners, but, but where's the best sort of venue for that? And do, did you engage bank to help out with that? Let's walk down the line. Okay. Uh, you know, we see opportunities coming from a wide range. At the end of the day, it's a fairly small industry. And uh, there are a few degrees of separation with any, any company. So my, we see an awful lot of opportunities coming from people we've worked with in the past. Maybe they, they've switched companies, but we've worked with them in the past. People you meet at banking events or at investor events. Um, and then we're finding an increasing number of opportunities coming to us through the investment banks that have been retained by the licensor. About Relipsa, did, did you guys do a speed dating phase, or how did, how did it work? We did do a speed dating phase, and certainly all the bioconferences are helpful for that. Uh, Future Leaders was helpful for that, um, so we met a lot of contacts that way. And the other path we used was flipping through all the contact lists of our leadership team and our board members, mm -hmm. and they were really, really helpful in connecting us with the right people. So those were the two paths we used to start discussions. Yeah, I'd say generally from our perspective, we, yeah, we've done speed dating as well, and again, it's been at the, the bio events are very good for that. Um, you just have to be careful how you manage your schedule. Um, uh, but yeah, that, those have been pretty successful for us. Um, you know, we get um, just spontaneous inbound as well for, uh, from companies um, who say, yeah, we've seen your product, um, seen what's on your website, would be interested in, in the discussion. And um, again, banks as well are another source. The recommendation I'd make is to expand discussions beyond just the BD teams. Uh, at the end of the day, two organizations are going to have to work together to bring a product successfully to market. And you need to make sure that both teams can work together, that there's a, a cultural fit and a respect 
of the expertise of each party. I'm, I'm glad you, you said that. There's a, there's a question I jotted or that came into my mind as I was driving in was as talks get underway, are there some cultural considerations that maybe a US based company should think about when, when dealing with a, a European partner or would be partner? I, I'd say the first thing is do you have a shared understanding of the medical need of the product and uh, mm -hmm. what this product is going to add to? the practice of, of medicine in Europe. And if you don't have that, then you fundamentally have a divergence that's very difficult to bridge. Uh, and the second one is, does your partner in Europe have the long-term commitment to your product? Uh, not only to the therapy area, but to actually to your product, and are they gonna be able to deliver? You're entering a partnership that uh, doesn't, it starts on signature, it doesn't end on signature, and so you're gonna have to work with this organization for the next 10 years plus uh, make sure that you have a cultural fit, uh, that you have the same perception of what is required to be successful. I would agree very much with what you said. Um, one of the things that attracted us to our partner, Vi4 Fresenius, um, was a very much a cultural uh, element. In fact, if you go onto our websites and look at our values, they're very similar. They value um, achievement through excellence. They value putting the patient first and they value collaboration, and those are values that we at Relipsa also hold very dear. So we were, we were very much aligned on that. And the other thing I would say, um, they demonstrated a level of commitment to our program, even in the partnering process. Uh, and we knew if we signed a partnership with them, we would be a priority. And so that made a difference in our discussions. I wanted to, to switch gears a bit and talk a little about deal structures. and. There haven't been a, a large number of deals solely for European rights, and I'm, I'm wondering if does that make it challenging to agree on terms when, when people are at the, the negotiating table? I, I think it comes to, back to having a shared understanding of what is the opportunity. Uh, and until you have that, you can't really structure something that makes sense for both parties. And the second thing is to understand what the long-term objectives, what does success look like for both parties? Um, we've done a large variety of deals. Um, so I think the world is moving away from the old-fashioned licensing deal where the licensee takes over the product and sends in a quarterly report or maybe has a six-monthly joint development committee and that's about it. Um, we're working much more closely with our, our licensors uh, in continuous contact, shared clinical trial programs, um, and deal structures that um, reflect the need for that cooperation. So we've done product-specific joint ventures um, we've done deals where the uh, licensor has the right to reacquire the rights to the product so that you know, some, some of the licensors we deal with are concerned that they may want to set up their own operations in Europe in five years time. They can't do it today. They can't justify it today, but they want the option to be able to get the product back and to use it as a foundation for creating their own operations in Europe. And we can structure deals around that type of flexibility. As long as you are upfront, honest with each other, and, and know what types of things are important to each company that you can structure a deal. Yeah. I'd say, I'd, uh, along with that, that you know, if, were we to get to the point where we'd say, yes, okay, we, yeah, we, we've seen our days, so we know what the, what we, where we need to focus, what we want to do, and we want to partner in Europe, we would certainly be looking at you know, companies who can be creative on the deal-making side. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just going back to the previous point, I think a really important characteristic that you need to look for is you know, who, have you got a champion for the product within your partner company um, and that's a, real, a really important aspect. The, uh, yeah we have talked you know, a bit about straight out licensing deals but like you said these are not the only option that, that are available so you, you opted why don't we, we talk a bit about the restructure Relips are opted for with a V4 for Xenios and then we can maybe go over to, to Norgy and you can provide some insights on a little more on, on the other deal structures that, that you contemplate. We did opt for more of a traditional licensing structure. Uh, what I would say is that was a structure that met the needs of Relipsa and met the needs of our partner by for Fresenius. So we were aligned on that. Um, what was really important to us was preserving you know, long-term value. And we were able to structure a deal that enabled us to do that. Um, we're looking to develop a market. Our partner by for Fresenius is looking to develop a market. We believe it's a large market opportunity, and it was really important for us to be able to participate in the upside of that opportunity. And Vifor was very open to you know to that concept. They they want us to share in that too. So, I think you know we all happen to be aligned on a more traditional licensing approach. And traditional licensing obviously can work and, and does work in many cases. 
Sometimes, as I said earlier, there are companies that want to preserve the option that, uh, to create their own European structure. Um, it's hard to do with uh, the first product. Um, usually these companies have a pipeline of products and they want to create the European structure when the third one gets to market, but then they need to have access to the first two. Um, and what we've done in that situation is create product-specific joint ventures uh, and then give the other party the right to buy us out, essentially. Uh, we've done deals where we help companies by applying our infrastructure. I think one of the changes in Europe these days is that the uh, relative weight and importance of a sales force to the rest of the compliance infrastructure has shifted. So it is fairly simple to set up a small, targeted, specialty pharmaceutical sales force going on a new therapy area compared to the infrastructure that you need in order to operate in a compliant way, whether it's market access or pharmacovigilance or regulatory affairs, medical information, and so forth. So we can use that infrastructure that we have across all 28 countries to support these sort of joint ventures that are smaller and product specific. Uh, it might be premature to ask you, but I'll ask anyway. So can you talk about some of the deal structures that, that you've sort of been at least contemplated or anticipated? Uh, not really at this time. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there, we've had um, a, a couple of very interesting proposals um, that we, we've looked that have been in. I mean, re really very very early stages of discussion, but it's really uh, you know not things that I'm in a position to talk about Fair. right now. So we, we have stressed the importance of, of a sales force, but but like you, you everyone here has said, you know, there are other factors as, as a, at work as well. Let's. Um, can we talk a little more in detail about some of the, um, the other, maybe less visible offerings that, that people should have and what medical liaisons I'm thinking or, or other parts of what really constitutes an integrated commercial team? Well, I think it starts with things like market access and mm -hmm. having a, just a knowledge of what it's going to take to get reimbursement for your product across the European marketplace. And, and when I say across the European marketplace, it doesn't necessarily mean all 28. As Peter said, he's primarily focused on the big five. And uh, just because it, something is called a country doesn't mean that it, it takes an equal importance. So you know, you, when you look at Europe as a whole, you maximize the opportunity in Europe by picking and choosing where you're going to do things and what order you're going to do things. But having that market access capability across all 28 is important. Having medical science liaisons across all 28 is important because you want to prepare the market um, even while the phase threes are, are ongoing or, or while the registration process is in, in process. And you can't obviously do that through marketing. The other aspect that's changed is that, especially in the specialty pharma sector, the importance, the relative importance of European meetings and the need to be, able, be present and have an established relationship with KOLs across those, the European societies has uh, increased, and, and you need to have a partner who has those links and, and is present. I would certainly agree with that. Um, Buy for Fresenius has a very strong KOL network mm -hmm. in nephrology and cardiology. In fact, as we were interacting with KOLs in Europe, they all knew Buy for Fresenius very, very well, and it was a sign to us that we were choosing the right partner. So their network was already well developed. Uh, we also looked at um, relevant experience but recent experience. So they very recently launched a product into the exact same therapeutic space that we need to launch ours. They had very recent and relevant experience with regulatory authorities uh, and also payers in the exact space we needed to be in. And so that was also something that we considered very valuable when partnering with them. Yeah, a consideration for us would certainly be um you know, current relationships with 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 the transplantation centers because you know, we have a product where you know, first these indications are basically firstly in stem cell transplant mm -hmm. and then you know, we have a solid organ transplant program just kicking off uh, and all of these centers basically have their protocols in place so if you understand the chance of getting adopted you, you've got to get on protocol in those centers and um, you know having those pre-existing relationships is is key being able to achieve that in a timely manner. You don't want to sort of be you know, going into a site completely afresh, just having got approved, saying, well, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this drug and whether we might get on protocol. You really want to start that a long time ahead. Is that something in the clini early clinical trial process that you're building familiarity with, or does that have to come, come later? It has to come when you've got the data. Yeah. Yeah, you need the data. Yeah. So 
What about you know in terms of just structuring a deal around a partner's needs? You know, what sort of conversations you know should you be advising people to to have, or what conversations do you have? You know, to get a really good picture of what you know, your would-be partner is is looking for, and you know, how does that structure start to emerge? What we try to do is is to to put aside the pieces of paper and sit try to sit on the same side of the table for the, the beginnings of the discussions and try to get a shared understanding of the opportunity, uh, of what data is going to be required, uh, how, how are you going to exploit that opportunity, and only then do you move to the next stage of saying, well, what, what exactly does each party want to get out of the collaboration? Uh, what are the long-term objectives? And then you can try to find solutions to uh, meet most, both companies' needs. Uh, if you try to rush too early into exchanging term sheets that are, are not underpinned by a shared understanding of the opportunity, I think you end up talking past each other and, and you end up with like, quite unproductive discussions. So we really try to start with you know, the, the market access people, the development people sitting in the same room and, and understanding what this opportunity is all about and how it's going to change medical care. I'm going to toss one out to, to all three of just asking about how a, a U.S. company can maybe discern whether a partner has sort of the necessary structure in place to really extract the value from your product that you're looking to get. Are there you know, some key aspects of their infrastructure that, that you need to see or perhaps maybe the type of track record you want to come in and have? You mentioned like, a recent launch right in your, in your product's wheelhouse, so that, that's got to help. But uh, were there other, other aspects? Yes, I mean, it's, it was the feedback we were getting from KOLs mm -hmm. about our potential partner. Um, we flew to visit them in Europe and, and met the team. Um, there were actually a lot of team interactions well before the deal was signed. And our internal team would meet with different subgroups separately and come back and say, wow, they really understand what we're trying to do. And that goes a long way. Yeah, I think I would look at it as well, you know, define what, um, you start off by defining what perfection looks like. Um, and then you know, hopefully find that. If you don't, well, you, what are you going to give up on in terms of uh, working slightly apart away from perfection? Um, but I, as I mentioned in you know, the previous piece of dialogue, you know, for us, it, it, one of the things that would be really key is that presence within you know, those transplantation centres, the, the, the current relationships, I think, we would look at as being very important. Um, previous experience, you know, ability to be flexible, um, you know, in terms of you know future trials required or desired for the European marketplace, you know, a lot of flexibility and discussion about how we do that, how we keep control over our asset. Effectively, mm -hmm. um, those are things that are important to us. Yeah, I think the most important thing is what Camille alluded to is if you can get the two teams working well together before the deal is signed, uh, it gives both parties confidence that. Um, afterwards, you'll be able to cooperate. So, our most successful partnerships are the ones where it's uh, at the before signature. It is the the regulatory team and the development team that are encouraging their business development people to get the deal done because they're so excited about working with us and vice versa. Um, that that's a really exciting start for a collaboration. I was reading just the other day about a, a biotech and a deal between a biotech and a mid-sized pharma that it wasn't in, in Europe. It was in a different territory, but it unwound and. You know, the, the biotech was alleging or contending that the, the mid-sized pharma had done precious little, essentially, to advance their product. And the, I guess the question at hand is how this can be avoided and how, you know, are there some maybe telltale signs that you might see during negotiations where, where it should raise a red flag? And, or is there a way to right the ship if you see it happening and after you've signed the deal? Um. I just can speak from previous experience, but I think you know um, having real professional alliance management is, is really important, um, which you know is something you know perhaps separate from sort of the functional operational groups. Um, but someone whose role really is to keep an eye on the KPIs, on the you know, achievement of goals, and uh, you know is meeting regularly, applying appropriate governance to the relationship. And really, you know, putting warning flags up as soon as they, uh, as soon as they, they are seen, rather than waiting for the operational groups to say, "Hey, I didn't hear from my counterpart for the last six months. I wonder how things mm -hmm. are going." You know, I think understanding where the other party is headed strategically for the long term is really helpful, and it, it's it's part of the diligence you do on your potential partner. But you want to understand, are they really committed to the space in which you're going to be playing in? Or are they going to 
do a reorganization and shift focus? Um, you know, these are questions you need to ask, and we certainly felt the level of commitment from Vi4 Fresenius to our space. It's yeah, having the strategic um, vision in your partner that you know that they are absolutely committed. Um, you know, companies have obviously reorganizations, changes, strategy. I think the company, the small biotech that gets the email saying that, that uh, their big partner is um, having a, bringing in a consultant to reorient their strategic priorities, that's sort of the nightmare email. And it's really sad. It's sad mm -hmm. when a fundamentally good product gets lost in uh, the uncertainty that goes along with that kind of a process mm -hmm. and then is tainted after, uh, even when it is returned. Um, so that is to be avoided at any cost. Having an alliance management team is, is critical to maintain communication. And uh, we created ours you know, about six, seven years ago now, and it's been hugely valuable to maintain those relationships. But it's, it's picking a partner who's not going to change direction um, every time that they have a reorganization. I'm going to switch gears, and you know, we've mentioned in our previous questions about reimbursement, so let's let's dive into that a little more. And I know Chimeric has said its market is you know, quote highly driven by transplant team protocols and payer access. Can you expand on exactly what that means and, and how it might shape your sure. thinking about a, a partner? Yeah. So you know, treatment for uh, so if you look at that first indication, which is stem cell transplantation, mm -hmm. um, you know th those patients undergo a conditioning regimen, um, and then there's a, a prescribed protocol for you know, antifungal drugs that they'll receive prophylactically for antibacterials they'll receive, um, because you're basically removing the patient's immune system to, to all intents and purposes. And um, you know, managing viral infections, you know, each, each site has a protocol as to how you'll do that and what products are to be used uh, for what infections. And, um, you know, it's really key for, if you're going to get adoption within the sites, to, to, to get on protocol. And that means you know, you've got to get the support of the, the transplanter, the infectious disease, transplantation nurse staff, pharmacy, um, to get on protocol. And then you get on protocol, get on formulary. Um, and that, that's sort of top yeah. to bottom approach, and yeah. you have to have yeah. the data in hand to, yeah. to do that in the first exactly. place. Right? Yeah. 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 And you also have to bear in mind you're dealing with uh, a situation where you know, use of the product is starting in the hospital, uh, but then the patient is going to be discharged before they finish their course of treatment. So it's going to move out into the community and you know, finding you know, a way to follow the patient, make sure that they don't stop therapy, that they continue. It's therapy. a really valuable point because we, we tend to focus too much on countries and an HTA process in the UK or Germany and not enough on the local implementation of that policy. I mean, at the end of the day, when NICE gives a recommendation on a product, it is just that, it is a recommendation. And that has got to be built into local um, budgets. Uh, and then if you have a product like Peter's where it is initiated in hospital, but a GP is going to be asked to renew the prescription, um, then you got to make sure that that GP understands the significance of it. Uh, now, uh, to be fair, in, in transplantation, I think they will probably do that. But in, in some of other indications, which um, have severe healthcare impact if you don't renew this prescription, it, if it's an expensive product, the GP may be resistant to renewing the prescription. And we find patients coming back into hospital uh, because the GP hasn't renewed the prescription. And that's really something that you want to avoid. Mm. Now, Relips has, has stressed the importance of V4's track record, not only getting drugs approved in Europe, but also in securing reimbursement and pricing. So can you, uh, can you all talk about the reimbursement landscape for your product in Europe, and, and you know, what sort of road ahead is there for, for you and your partner? Yeah, I, and what I would say is it's a little premature to comment on reimbursement strategy. Uh, specifically, though we're working very closely um, with V4 Fresenius um, on this, you know, for our product, we are talking about a treatment paradigm shift. Um, it's, it's a new way of managing hyperkalemia, and there will be some educating that needs to be done, and there's gonna need to be some awareness we need to, um, we need to do with payers, and it's about generating some data to support the value proposition for managing hyperkalemia chronically, uh, and so that's what we're working on right now. Um, you've gone through the process of, with multiple uh, drugs and diagnostics. Can you Talk about sort of your, your interactions with European payers and you know the, how you're really convincing them of the value of the products you're putting forward. Uh, the first thing I'd say is it's changing extremely quickly. 
And uh, frankly, if you have five-year-old data, then you're out of date and um, it's no longer applicable. I think it's one of the concerns we have in dealing with American companies that they very frequently are using slightly out-of-date uh, notions of, of what the European pricing landscape is. Uh, it's very hard to generalize. At the end of the day, you need data from ideally controlled clinical trials with meaningful endpoints against standard of care. And standard of care can differ from country to country and it can differ from what is on, uh, on, a, on a label. I mean, you can easily have a pricing authority that is asking you to compare with uh, an unregistered use of an existing drug, and you have to figure out ways in which you're going to address that problem. You know, are you going to do a clinical trial, which can be difficult in certain uh, circumstances, or are you going to try to get around that with um, other type ways of addressing that comparison? And what Cynic might say that that sort of off-label comparator is likely to be the least expensive drug out there. How do you? Uh, in, in our experience, the pricing authority very rarely takes the most expensive alternative <laughs> as their baseline. So, given that they're probably going to find a very inexpensive alternative, yeah. Does that? How do you? How do you make sure that you're aware of well what that is, and then B, how do you go about designing that that trial or get at least getting the data, even if it's not a trial? Well, the aware of you just have to be present, and you have to be dealing with the KOLs, and you you know, and, and do all the normal things about understanding what standard of care for your uh, therapy area is. Uh, how do you deal with it? Really depends on, on what the what the standard of care is, and how different it is, and where your advantage lies. I mean, is your advantage in um, better outcomes? Is your advantage in sell, saved healthcare costs? Is your advantage in quality of life of the patient? Um, is it your advantage because in reality compliance will be higher? There, there are many different ways in which a new product can have an advantage, but whatever it is, you've got to prove it. And one could argue that it's not always just a clinical trial that's going to do that. No. I mean, there are other, there are other methods of doing that, such as China has look at you no know, um, standard of care in other regions, regions where you do have data, and then bridging to see what the differences are in standard of care across European territories and then trying to simulate well, what is the impact of my treatment on that standard of care within those territories. Have right, and, and, and health economics you know, plays a big role. And I mean, we, we have sort of a team of people internally that are just working on developing health economic models to try to demonstrate the value of our product. And that will vary by country. So some countries will allow you to take in, into account uh, secondary costs. Um, other countries won't, and, and you need to have that local knowledge. Do you find there's general agreement on what standard of care is, or is it going to, even within a given country or from hospital to hospital, might it, might it change? I'm happy to comment on that. We have found that it varies greatly. Um, in some countries, we found there, there is no standard of care. These patients aren't being managed at all. Um, other countries, it's managed differently, and there's great variability. And so a lot of discussion right now about what country requires what pieces of data in order to get access but a lot of variability. Yeah. Which sort of underscores the European paradox, right? Yeah. On, on the one hand, you have to deal with Europe as a single entity, and you need one registration and one, one approach to it. On the other hand, you're dealing with the situation that Camille describes, that every market's different, uh, and you have to build in those differences into your, into your plan. Mm. I'd agree. I totally agree. I mean, it's been, I, I experienced it. One of the indications that you know, will subsequently come with our product is the treatment of serious adenovirus infection. And um, you know we know the standard of care. The, the standard of care is, is pretty base at the moment for that. But it's been interesting because actually, you know, there are, because it, it's not been something that's been screened for typically in the past because there's been really been no treatment for it. Mm -hmm. And so you know we, we we have come across you know certain countries who said no, we don't have adenovirus. Really? Oh, okay. Uh, and then you know, a month later, you get an EIND request coming in. Um, we have an adenovirus case, and um, you know, the, 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 the approach to, to, to managing those patients does vary greatly across, um, across some of the, the countries, is what we've seen. And just the awareness of, the, of, that, of that virus is, is very variable. Mm -hmm. Which says you have to build early. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm sure you're already doing it. You need to get KOLs involved uh, in order to raise the profile of, of the condition that you're trying to treat and, and make sure that when you do get to the pricing discussion, you've got local support. Uh, from people who understand standard of care in the country and can emphasize to the payer the value that this new product is bringing. Yeah, how, how does that dynamic work of getting that local support and really kind of having them kind of help you out or help their product out? Because 
these, these people are ideally interested in, in seeing this thing come to market and get reimbursed and used. So how do you kind of make sure that they're aware of it and or be able to communicate that value to, to the reimbursement authorities? Uh, like anywhere else, you start with ad boards, you start with having KOL contacts, and you, if you, to the extent you're doing clinical trials, if they are involved in those clinical trials, that's obviously helpful because that will force a knowledge about mm -hmm. the product. Um, but uh, it's uh, being present in the market, and it's one of the things that drives us to, to try to license in early is it allows us to um, hire teams of MSLs and um, clinical trial assist, uh, associates in order to to manage the relationships with the KOLs in, in that target area. I want to switch again and talk to the, the topic of patient engagement. Biocentury has written many, many stories on, on the topic. You know, I'm just interested in hearing thoughts from, from each of the panelists about how to make sure the party across from you at the negotiating table is taking the, you know, the issue is to, to heart and not just giving it lip service. A great question. It's, I mean, the whole patient advocacy area, particularly in the, you know, the the therapeutic areas we're working in, is very mm -hmm. important, and and is something we're really building on at the moment in in the United States. Um, again, you know, were we to engage um, with a partner um, outside the United States, we would expect there to be, you know, a similar um, level of effort made um, within for the Europe within European patient advocacy groups. I mean, we already know. Pretty well, who who those groups are, um, and uh, we'll probably have, you know, some of our own work going on with them um, as we build up to um, making that decision of go it alone or partner, um, and you know, then how much of that we continue to do depends on what that decision is. There's very much an element of creating awareness for patients in the hyperkalemia space. It's an asymptomatic condition. You don't wake up one day and feel like you're hyperkalemic. Um, but the repercussions of that are very serious. Uh, and what I would say, it's similar to the phosphate binder space or hyperphosphatemia. Again, asymptomatic, but severe repercussions. Uh, Vifor Fresenius recently launched a phosphate binder, and it's going to be a very similar patient outreach um, with that program as it will be for ours. But the patient outreach tends to be with patient associations, as Peter said. Direct-to-consumer advertising uh, yeah. is illegal um, in, in Europe, and so that's really not something that, that we contemplate doing. Uh, it's, it's really just forming relationships with patient associations. Make sure that you understand, because they have an understanding of, of what is the impact of um, the condition on their, their members or the, mm -hmm. the patients that they deal with um, and therefore they can be useful in supporting uh, pricing discussions because they can bring that patient perspective to the discussion and at the same time they can play a role in making sure that uh, patients are generally kept aware of advances in the space even if they're not dealing with you on a product specific basis so. mm -hmm. and you tend to find I mean that just the level of of patient engagement varies by condition. I mean, when you're dealing with really serious conditions, such as a, a, a stem cell transplant, you tend to find that the patients and their families are, are very engaged. Yes. Are there any other maybe underappreciated or, or unanticipated aspects of, of European partnering? That one thing that comes to mind is that I was just speaking with a, a European investor who, like after the particular company did a European deal, they said, oh, I'm, I'm going to invest in them now. because." I know about the product, it's very interesting to me, and I want to own the stock. Is that, you know, are there other intangibles that, that you know, one might think about? Well, I think, um, I'm not really sure how to address that. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think having, we are already pretty well known in Europe um, from the investor okay. standpoint. Um, you know, we did a, a follow on in June this year and had a lot of European interest in that follow on. Um, you know, I don't, I wouldn't profess to say that's because we've been going out saying a lot in Europe. We did, we've, we've been present in Europe talking to investors, but uh, we had a lot of interest in that last follow on, which uh, was very encouraging. I would say we've been very focused in the US and in Europe on creating long term value and developing a new market. And I think by bringing on an experienced partner, it just reinforced what we've been saying all the time. You know, we're, we're here to, to bring a new product to patients, to develop a new market. We think of bringing a partner on board is the best way to help us do that and create the most value long term. And so I think it's reinforced what we've been saying all along. Because we do a lot of European-only deals, we're a you know, European-centric company, 
uh, and yet working with a lot of American companies. I, I like to think that one of the things we, the knock-on benefits of, of working with a company like Norgene is that we bring a more commercial perspective to the development of the product that in turn hopefully influences their development in the United States. Um, you know, Europe is a very highly constrained pricing environment. The U.S. is changing rapidly and uh, the need to demonstrate the value of your product will come here. And so, in a sense, we're ahead of where the U.S. might end up in 10 or 20 years. And, and there's something to be learned by cooperating and collaborating in the development of the project. Well, well thank you for participating today. I'd now like to ask each panelist for, for maybe a closing remark. And let's start with Peter. Well, first of all, it's been a pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, and I hope that it's useful for the audience. I think the central message that we're trying to communicate to potential partners is that while Europe is complex, it, it is a very large market that if you take it appropriately and early in the development process can be a very valuable contributor to uh, the economics of the development of your, your product. What we'd urge everyone to do is find a partner you can work with, find a partner who shares your passion and who has an infrastructure, a real infrastructure spanning all of Europe and is therefore able to bring that knowledge to bear on the development of your project. Yes, thank you very much for hosting. This has been some great discussion. Um, I think there's multiple ways to go about accessing Europe. We believe we've gone down the path that is the best for us and the one that creates the most value. And we look forward to working with our partner Vifor Fresenius to ensure that our important medicine gets to patients around the world. Yeah, and likewise, thanks for hosting. It's been great, it's been a great discussion. I mean, I'd say that you know, for a, if I was going to give advice to a, a US company who wants to keep their partnering options open until they do have their data, you know, don't ignore the fact that you may need to end up, part or may want to end up partnering. So put the effort in to developing your European um, base, making sure that these clinical trials are going to be acceptable to the regulators, talk to the payers, get some market research done, and then you can leave your options open until you have your data, and then find the right partner. Great. Well, thank you all for participating today in this webcast, and we'll see you next time.